Enantiomers are carbon atoms with four different substitutions. One of them might be hydrogen, but not two. If there are four different substitutions, a strange thing happens, which is that you may get left and right-handed versions of the same molecule. This is something that is really difficult to convey in two dimensions, like on a screen. I'll try to work up a demonstration. Two molecules may be enantiomers if they have a carbon atom with four different substitutions. This means that that carbon atom cannot have any double or triple bonds. Another word for a carbon that has four different substitutions is a stereocenter, or it may be called an asymmetric carbon. And this carbon atom will form left and right-handed versions. Enantiomers are an important consideration in the synthesis of pharmaceuticals. If a drug has one or more asymmetric carbons, one form of the drug may be effective, and the opposite-handed form may be ineffective or worse, cause unwanted side effects. In this slide, we see two different drugs with asymmetric carbon atoms, ibuprofen and albuterol. In the case of ibuprofen, the left-handed version is effective and the right-handed ineffective. In albuterol, the opposite is true. So it's not the case that it's always the left-handed version that is functional or the right-handed version is functional. It depends. Up until now, I've told you about the variability we see in just carbon and hydrogen. And we know from chapter two that the three-dimensional shape of a molecule is essential to its function, either in a reaction flask or in a living cell. The last topic in this introduction to organic chemistry is functional groups. Living molecules have a few important components that increase the complexity and the need for order and increase the functionality of these compounds. There are seven important wink functional groups that you should recognize as we'll be seeing a lot of them for a while to go this semester. In this image, we have two molecules that superficially look very similar. The yellowish shapes are hydrocarbon skeletons that have been folded into four rings, which is a pattern we see in steroids, which will be covered in chapter five. The two molecules are similar except for the region shown in blue, which are three of the functional groups you're about to meet. These two molecules are estradiol and testosterone. Perhaps you've heard of them. Estradiol is a hormone associated with female secondary sexual characteristics such as mammary gland development and maturation of the ovaries. Testosterone is associated with male secondary sexual characteristics, such as facial hair growth and testicular maturation. So these small, almost insignificant differences in the shapes of these molecules are quite significant to the organisms that produce them. The first functional group that we will meet is this one in the lower corner, left corner of estradiol, the hydroxyl group. The hydroxyl group, OH, looks very much like the hydroxide ion that we saw when water dissociates. It's not the same thing, though, because once this OH group covalently bonds to carbon, it doesn't behave in the same way. Organic molecules with hydroxyl groups are called alcohols and include the highly regulated consumable ethyl alcohol, or ethanol, that is found in beer, wine, white claws, and distilled liquors like whiskey, vodka, gin, etc. Why don't we call it table alcohol? Opportunity missed, I guess. Another important common household alcohol is isopropanol, down here in the lower right, or rubbing alcohol, used as a surface disinfectant and should not be taken internally. Alcohols often end with a suffix ol, such as in estradiol, and cholesterol. Because oxygen is more strongly electronegative than carbon or hydrogen, the hydroxyl functional group is polar, and smaller alcohols are water-soluble as a result. The second functional group of interest is the carbonyl or carbonyl group. You can say it either way. I like both. In addition to two pronunciations, which are not important, there are two types of carbonyl functional groups, which are important. In general, our carbonyl group is an oxygen atom double bonded to a carbon atom. 
Unlike a hydroxyl functional group, the carbonyl oxygen is only attached to a single carbon atom with no hydrogens. Where you find a carbon atom, however, determines whether you have a ketone or an aldehyde. A ketone is a carbonyl group that is inside a carbon skeleton, internal. An aldehyde is a carbonyl functional group that is terminal at the end of a carbon skeleton so that the carbon is attached both to the oxygen and also to a hydrogen. So these two groups are chemically similar, but not exactly identical. Here you can see two examples of a carbonyl functional group, one of which is a ketone, and the other of which is an aldehyde. You might notice another feature of these two molecules, which is that they have the same molecular formula, but with a different arrangement of the covalent bonds. So a quick recap, what do we call molecules that have this relationship? This functional group also contains oxygen, so again, it is polar. Here are some examples of ketones that have biological relevance. Acetone is the simplest ketone and it is a common solvent and an ingredient in nail polish remover. Testosterone, which we've already seen. In acetone and testosterone, we can see that both of these end in O-N-E, which is commonly found in ketones. However, you don't see that in phenyl pyruvic acid or in tetracycline down here. Uh, phenyl pyruvic acid is associated with the disease phenylketonuria which is a genetic disorder, and tetracycline is an antibiotic. Aldehydes typically end in AL or in aldehyde. Formaldehyde is the simplest aldehyde, which until recently it was used widely to preserve biological specimens, but today we are moving away from its use because of its toxicity. You can probably guess the biological origins of vanillin and cinnamaldehyde. Many pleasant smells are produced by molecules with aldehyde functional groups. Retinal, also known as retinaldehyde, has a third name, which you may have already heard. It's also called vitamin A, don't you see? The third functional group, before we leave oxygen behind for a bit, is the carboxyl functional group. As with the other oxygen-containing functional groups, these are polar. This functional group is called carboxylic acids, also known as organic acids. These molecules can be recognized in reading because they usually end in ic acid, or A-T-E. While this molecule might look like the carbonyl and hydroxyl functional groups had a baby together, it sure doesn't act like it. It behaves differently in that the proton on the second oxygen atom can be donated to solution, as acids usually do. This means that you can find organic acids in the non-ionized form, as you see on the left here, or the ionized form, once they have donated their proton. When they are ionized, they can form salts because they function as anions. This is a very common functional group in living tissue, as we will see in chapter 5. Here are some examples of organic acids. On the left are a couple of short-chain fatty acids. While aldehydes are associated with pleasant smells, usually these two short-chain fatty acids are associated with an unpleasant smell. Ginkgo trees are known for producing seeds that have a smell that has been likened to dog feces. Ginkgo seeds contain both butyric acid and caproic acid. Butyric acid is so named because it is the smell of rancid butter. And caproic acid is so named because it is the smell of goats. You mix those two smells together, and I guess you get the smell like dog poop. On the right over here is a figure showing some omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. You may have heard of omega-3 fatty acids as a supplement recommended to combat heart disease, but we'll talk more about those again in chapter 5. 
Our first non-oxygen containing functional group is the amino functional group. The amino group contains nitrogen, and the molecules with this functional group often end in I-N-E. While the carboxyl group functions as an acid, donating protons to solutions, amino groups function as bases, absorbing protons from solution. Like carboxyl functional groups, they can exist in both ionized and non-ionized states. It seems like carboxyl and amino groups might have a special relationship we should discuss. Yes, they do. Later. Though glycine here might give you a hint. Sulfhydryl groups contain sulfur bonded to hydrogen. Sulfur is a little bit more electronegative than hydrogen or carbon, so this functional group is very weakly polar. Thiols is what we call sulfhydryl containing molecules. Sulfhydryl groups are useful connectors between biological molecules. In proteins, sulfhydryl groups may shed their protons to form a disulfide bridge, a covalent bond that stabilizes protein structure. When hair, which is mostly the protein keratin, is straightened or curled, the cross-linking in the protein is altered. Another example of a connecting molecule is this monstrosity called coenzyme A. This molecule is a real treasure trove of functional groups, but the one I want to bring your attention to is this sulfhydryl group here at the lower uh, right end here. I don't want you to memorize the structure of this molecule, but I do want you to put a mental pin in the name, coenzyme A, which you will hear again towards the end of Unit 2. Speaking of Unit 2, another functional group that will feature prominently is the phosphate functional group. A phosphorus atom with four surrounding oxygens might lead you to think that the, the electrons are quite active in this functional group, and you'd be correct. Phosphate groups are a great way to store potential energy in a molecule as well as to build our DNA. These three letters, ATP, will become a daily topic of conversation for most of Unit 2. It stands for adenosine triphosphate, and when the third phosphate group reacts with water, it releases energy that the cell can use to do amazing things. The last functional group is a simple nonpolar hydrocarbon, the methyl group. This is the one functional group whose presence is indicated at the beginning rather than at the end of a molecule, as you see in 5-methylcytidine. The methyl functional group is very, very common. We've seen it many times in this lecture and may not have even recognized it. The addition of methyl groups to our DNA, called methylation, is an important part of determining which genes are shut on or off in a cell. We can also see the simple methylation of a steroid can make a big difference in the activity of these two compounds. As we prepare to advance to the last chapter of this unit, putting the previous three chapters together, I want to return to the question of mechanism and vitalism. While our technology might not have given us artificial tea, Earl Grey, hot, like Captain Picard likes it, Hopefully this chapter has opened your eyes as to why it is such a difficult and complex question. A variety of different problems can arise in synthesis. The length of carbon chains, branching, position of double bonds, structural isomerization, cis-trans isomerization, active and inactive enantiomers, and the correct placement of functional groups. It is still far, far easier and cheaper to grow a tea bush and harvest the leaves to produce a nice cuppa. And now we know why the problem is such a challenge. But does it matter if we accept vitalism or mechanism? Let me give you an example. Aspirin is the common name for acetyl salicylic acid. Hopefully you recognize at least one functional group from the name. Acid... Aspirin has been produced synthetically for over 120 years. The original source of salicylic acid is willow bark from the genus Salix. As the human population has increased from millions to hundreds of millions into the billions, 
all of those humans developing inflammation and fever over the course of their lives, how would that affect the population of willow trees if the willow trees were the only source of this drug? Knowing how to synthesize and regulate the active ingredient has been a great boon to humanity. Still not convinced? One more example. Taxol is a more complex compound that was originally discovered in the Pacific yew tree. Taxol is an effective chemotherapy agent in a number of forms of metastatic cancer, including breast, lung, ovarian, skin, prostate, and esophageal cancers. While many species of willow can produce aspirin, Pacific yew is the only species that produces taxol. Its range is restricted to the western United States, it is not abundant within that range, and it is not a fast-growing species. So is it important that biochemists can synthesize this complex compound without having to decimate a rare natural resource at great expense? Once again, here we have our learning objectives. And finally, we wrap up the unit in the long chapter five, which will be broken down into two parts.